Hi, I'm Sean Scott here with WBRO, and uh, today we get the chance to meet Chase Smith, a Republican candidate for the 77th Judicial Circuit Prosecutor's Office. Chase, thank you for coming to the studios today. Happy to do it. Happy to do it. So, Chase, I want you to start off. I know you, and uh, but why don't you just uh, introduce yourself, uh, a little bit of background about where you come from, family, and, and uh, just go ahead. Sure. Well, I, I come from here. My family moved here in well, right before my second birthday. Uh, Memorial Day weekend before my second birthday, actually, and I grew up in Crawford County, Milltown Elementary, Crawford County Junior High School, Crawford County Senior High School, where I, I graduated as a, as a Lilly Scholar in 2008. And I went to college at Butler, you know, came back after Butler, then went to law school, and in, and in that time, I've, I've lived in Crawford County the, the whole time. As depressing as it sounds, I, I've lived at the same address <laughs> since since the early 1990s, and you know, still my home today. And I, I'm currently a deputy prosecuting attorney in Jefferson County, where um, I have a lot of responsibilities. It, it's I'm one of the the three attorneys that are assigned to permanently assigned to our superior court, where I do felonies, misdemeanors. I'm in charge of our infraction court. I'm in charge of our juvenile docket. It's it's kind of I'm a jack of all trades in our office. I, I see a little bit of everything. So when you left Crawford County High School in May of 2000. And and eight. Eight, okay. Uh, what were your thoughts? I mean, you knew you had a Lilly Scholarship, but what, did you have goals at that time? Where, what was your direction at that time? So part of accepting the Lilly Scholarship, and or at least what I interpret as part of my accepting the Lilly Scholarship, is that there was an intent for me to come back to Crawford County and to, to serve the community in, in whatever form that may be. You know, not necessarily everybody goes to law school, right? I, I don't really recommend it for a lot of people, but not everybody goes to law school. And not every, it's, it's however you can serve. And I, I was raised in a family that learned to appreciate public service. You know, my dad retired as lieutenant colonel. My mom, who's the current veteran service officer, you know, we, we, it's a family that appreciates public service. And so I knew from when I graduated that my goal in whatever form that may be would be to serve the public and in this case it happens to be running for prosecuting attorney of the 77th judicial circuit awesome so so how did you get so you talked about you went to butler um give us a little bit about your your college background there and and where you ended up um as a prosecutor currently uh, chief uh, deputy at, at jefferson county jefferson county okay. jefferson county indiana okay uh, it's it's that one I, I oh that's a lo that's one you got to explain a lot well I, I i do because i say oh you yeah. drive to louisville like no yeah. it'd be nice if i just drove to yeah. louisville I, I drive to madison yeah no so uh actually this summer after my freshman year of college i started interning for the floyd county prosecutor's office under keith henderson and i worked there the summers and christmases through college and then after college i i, I worked there full time until i went to law school when i you know when i was in college that was um that was an experience you know that was you know, the, the college experience is more than just going to classes, right? And I spent time, I was the, the chair of the College Republicans for, for two years. I was their political director for a year. That's, that's exactly as nerdy and boring as it sounds, but it's just, it was part of it. Where that, being in Indianapolis during that period of time, where, you know, I, 2008, 2008 was a major year in presidential politics. Right. And so I vividly remember where I was when they called California and call, when they called California in the presidential election, that was when, you know, the 44th president of the United States was elected. And that was just, it was a very interesting time to be on a college campus. And you just, the full comprehensive college experience teaches you to be exposed to different attitudes and different backgrounds. And it makes you, you know, the, the liberal arts mentality makes you a more complete person. Now, I'm not saying college is for everybody, but I'm saying, you know, that, that, my life experiences that I that I gained when I was in university really shaped me as a person, the person I am now. I like to think that it's I'm, I'm homegrown values, but you know, uh, whole world experience kind of thing. You know, it's it's kind of interesting. In in 1991, I come back from the Philippines after uh, in the Air Force, and and I interned under uh, um, uh, Len Lop, who was a prosecutor at the time. But it was kind of funny is that's actually my first true involvement in politics was in 1987 and a buddy of mine that i went to school with at floyd central uh, his cousin lynn lop was was running for uh, prosecutor and so it was a chance to get out of school mm -hmm. to help in the camp or in the election day and so i think all we did is went out there and held out cards or whatever but it, it was my first actual experience to politics and um, and then of course like I said lynn 
becoming prosecutor and then and then becoming judge. Uh, he was elected judge while I was actually interning with him. Uh, and then Keith Henderson, my dad introduced me to Keith, and he said, uh, Keith's a brand new state trooper into the area. He says, man, you're going to love this guy. 1986. And, and yeah. so I said, uh, so when I got back, and, 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 and then Keith is a state trooper, you know, I guess that's not exactly what he wanted to do. You know, and got his, went back to school, uh, got his law degree, and, and you know, into his 20s, uh, right late 20s, actually, mm -hmm. uh, and then and then going to Floyd County. So it's, it's kind of neat how, so I say that, because I know I've known you since in high school, and I know you've always been involved in the politics, um, and that's a very crucial uh, knowledge to have, especially with the officer of with the office of prosecutor. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your political experience, because I know you've got a lot. Well, so we mentioned Keith Henderson. Actually, my my first political experience, I was nine. It was when one Keith Henderson was running for prosecuting attorney in Crawford County. He later won. I, it was my first political event I'd ever been to. I, I was actually cleaning up tables at a chicken dinner at uh, the old Marengo School. Okay. It was actually the first thing I ever did. Mm -hmm. And yeah, through school, I, I was um, involved with the Republican Party. My precinct committeeman, a guy by the name of Dan Crusilius, who is that Dan Crusilius, mm -hmm. he got me involved in politics. Actually, when I turned 18, his, his wife, Angela, came to the house to make sure I was registered to vote. <laughs> and even before that, you know, there's a program where high school students can uh, work on election day. If you're interested, by the way, contact your clerk's office. But there was a program where if you were uh, of a certain age, you could work in certain positions at polling places. You could be, you can be anything but the inspector. And I, I did all of those jobs where from a very early age. And you, when you agree to do it, you don't realize you live in Milltown and you, you've agreed to go to um, Alton at, at five o'clock the next morning. Be there at five, <laughs> I don't recommend it. Yeah. But, so being part it's of- It's not Alton, daylight at five in Alton. It, it's not- Never, it, I, I, never. It's, it's almost it. daylight the night before at Alton. <laughs> but it, it's so involved in politics. You know, I when I was when I was 17, I had the chance to hear President Bush speak. I, I went to an event in at Silver Creek and it was it was just an interesting experience to, to see you know the, the people being excited about politics, and and even beyond that you know after after school, you know I was like college Republicans as we talked about, and then in in fourteen I took an ex I took an appointment to the Crawford County Election Board where you know I served as chair for that year, which was a big year in Crawford County yeah, politics. It was. It, yeah. it was a seismic shift. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot went on, and it was really important to have good people. And I was lucky enough to have two amazing people, Diana Conrad and Edna Brown, that are two people that I, for whom I have absolutely nothing but respect. We we worked together, and, and we had a, what I think a, a fairly smooth. I mean, it, it's like seeing the duck above the water, right on top of the water. The duck looks like it's moving sm smoothly, but the legs are you know going like crazy. That's kind of what the election is, but it looks smooth to everybody else. Right. That's really what matters. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you know, and actually, I sit in on on that hearing, and and there was a lot of things that happened in probably a, a four year span right there. Um, I I got to witness I think three recounts, um, and then the contested candidacy uh, hearing, and and some others. And so, you know, I think for so many years, um, and, and again, maybe it's just not my exposure too. You, you just think it all runs great, but mm -hmm. but in the background, there's a lot of chaos. Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's jump in. You got you started off with with Floyd County at the prosecutor's office there. So let's talk about what is the office of the prosecutor. Um, what happens in the office of prosecutor? What goes on there? And your experience that you've had uh, with Floyd County and Jefferson County and and you've you've observed in Crawford County. And so talk about that a little bit. So the, the prosecutor is the chief law enforcement officer of Crawford County. Like, we're, we're considered law enforcement. We don't consider ourselves law enforcement because, you know, our jobs are substantially safer than a real law enforcement officer's mm -hmm. job is. But uh, it's everything from, you know, we when a crime happens, we, we see it through to all the way through, right? A, uh, a report comes into our office with a probable cause affidavit. We make charging decisions. And you know, then we work the case. Some cases are resolved at an initial hearing. If they aren't, they progress to other issues. You know, there there's discovery. There's uh, there are depositions that happen. There's a negotiation between a defense attorney and our office. There and and it's not just people think when they think oh a, a crime is committed, you assume like a murder case, where it can be a lot of things, right? I, I mentioned that I do infraction court. Mm -hmm. When you have you you fail to you know have the the proper shots for your dog or a, a boating incident, 
or speeding tickets. That, that's all part of the process. And people think, and, and not unlike in law enforcement, what we call the CSI effect, where people assume that, you know, for, for every case there's this, you know, this minutia of DNA that we can find. That's how we're going to convict somebody. That very rarely happens. <laughs> it's, just, it's just not true. Well, in, in my part of this story, it's, it's the law and order effect, mm -hmm. where people think that my entire job is to stand in a courtroom and argue all day. My job would be unbelievably less complicated if that was true. Yeah. It's it's everything leading up to it, right? When you see the iceberg, the, the, the very tip of the iceberg is, is the actual courtroom. Going to trials, very, while important, and, and a very important part of the job, is a very, very small part of what actually happens in the prosecutor's office. But it's, it's, it's not only what you do in the office, it's community outreach, right? In, in Floyd County, we, we were working on a project where it was go more of going into the community. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this pilot program where we were going to, we were going to call it the Citizens Academy, where it gave you an in-depth look, look in what it was like to be in our office. It's outreach in the community. Uh, famously, not famously, it, it, you had to be in Floyd County to know this, my, my boss used to go to the elementary schools. And speaking on different issues, uh, internet safety being a big mm -hmm. one, sure. it's it's incredibly complicated to tell to talk about internet safety with a bunch of eighth graders without using the actual terminology. Right, incredibly complicated <laughs> to do. <laughs> but it's it's about outreach. It's about involvement in the community. It's about um, knowing who you are. Right, the ABCs always be closing. Right, people should always know the prosecutor is the prosecutor, and that should be something people recognize. Where you're in a position of authority and trust in the community. So it's not, being in a courtroom is a very, very small part of what the prosecutor does. So what has been some of the high points that you've had in your tenure now uh, with the different courts, uh, and personally or professionally? Right, yeah, I, I'm, I'm lucky to have practiced in, well, I practiced as a, legal, as a certified legal intern in Floyd County, where I worked under two or three different judges. Um, I got to observe fascinating cases and very fascinating, fascinating things that happened from from a serial killer case that I, I was peripherally in, uh, involved in, murder cases, to in Jefferson County where you know I, I've I've done trials, I've done the bench trials, I've done all of that, and the the things that are the high points for me are not what people think, right? I, I remember Keith um, one day I, I asked him what his record was, and he said, "What do you mean?" I said, well, "How many cases have you won?" Mm -hmm. And he said seven and I said you, you've only won seven cases and he mm -hmm. said no chase seven is the number of cases I didn't win because that's the only the number law. that matters yeah. Right? Yeah, right so I mean if your job is is to do justice right it's it's it's, it's to get a conviction obviously right. following the rules and the procedures I mean that's that's the goal that's the goal right. but it's it's everything else it's whenever okay when um, I have this very awful domestic battery case and the moment that the verdict was read, I got to watch the look on the victim's face where she knew he was never going to be able to hurt right. her again. And right. that, that's the stuff that speaks to you. It, it, it's not you know, winning a verdict in this case. Of course, that's important, right? That's, that's, that is an important part of the job. But it's way more about yeah, the people are important. And it, it's about the, it's the little things in life that, that, that keep you going and make the job worthwhile. You know, you've had a you've had a, a a very deep involvement in the in the county and the community for a long time now. What do you know? Can you explain to me a little bit about your personal knowledge of our county's strengths and weaknesses, um, and how you feel that do, do you do you feel like you can make a difference in in this position as prosecutor? How that can enhance or uh, go with that? Sure. So I, I serve on a couple, three different boards in the county. I'm, I'm on the, Rede the, the Economic Redevelopment Commission and the Economic Development Corporation. And, and that's given me uh, an interesting insight into the economic issues in the county, right? It, it is almost without question we are the poorest county in Indiana, right? It, it's just a fact. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Part of it is the, the lack of development in the county, right? And there, there, are there are a lot of reasons for that that I don't need to go into, but there are reasons. And because of the lack of industry and the lack of development, there is a population downshift, right? Where I can name, uh, you know, mine and Corey's graduating class had mm -hmm. 156 people in it. Right. Um, I know that not just because I was class president, but, um, and I had to know that, but yeah. it's, <laughs> and I can tell you, 
I can tell you roughly the percentage of people in my class that came back, and it's not a unique story to, right. to my class. Right. But it, it's about um, – so because the population is going down and because there are economic issues, that, that breeds problems. That breeds poverty, right? Poverty breeds other issues where – and then it just – it causes more problems, right? And it's a systemic issue. When you add in the recurring drug problem and how the drug problem is exploding and it just it just is not getting better. When there's a drug problem and it's a serious drug problem, drugs lead to thefts and burglaries because they're trying to get drug money, right? That, mm -hmm. That's what it is. Or it's OWIs or it's public intoxes or it's batteries all related to drugs. Mm -hmm. And ha how, what are my skills that, that can help? It was common knowledge in Floyd County, well, it was common knowledge in, in the city of Louisville, that if you crossed the Sherman Minton Bridge, you were going to get caught and you were going to go to prison. I mean, it, it was a firm line in the sand. You, you hold the line you know, from the rising cesspool. You know, there, there's a tide that you have to hold where hold people accountable. And you quite there. There is an element of you have to make drug dealers afraid of what's going to happen sure, to them in Crawford sure. County, where and and one of the strengths of Crawford County is feeds into that, where it is a very close knit community. It is a very strong community in that. Okay, I also I serve on the Southern Indiana Veterans Living and Rehabilitation Facility Board. It's it's a mouthful, but the Sibler Board, and I say that because we we had a fundraiser last year, uh, a, a yard sale, and in the middle of COVID we raised $10,000 in a weekend for our tiny home community. And that just shows you how incredibly generous Absolutely. people are. Like yeah. Incredibly generous people. And when I, what, well, the reason why the tight knit community is so important is that, you know, that that person who is dealing drugs in our community doesn't belong here. Mm -hmm. Right. And when you get to a jury, these are people who have strong values and that is very important. You know, a conviction that you would get in Crawford County, much harder to get in a Marion County. Right, because it's just these are people who this is what they're doing for the day. Whereas I think there's a strong feeling of civic duty and civic engagement, and people take jury duty seriously, even though that is a small part. Of, like I said, jury trials are a small part of the job, but it's an important part of the job. And it's knowing that as the prosecutor, I will have the support of the community in that we take issues like drugs very seriously, and they expect me to do my job. They expect me to prosecute people, and fundamentally people are going to go to prison and they expect me to do that and i think knowing that i have a very active community behind me is is encouraging and it is it'll keep you on the straight and narrow path because if you ever you know rest on your laurels there are people there to explain your failings to you right and and we can name names and and the, the citizens that are important to to do that i think those are the important parts of the county yeah you know i, I that's one of the things that I can I can say I can think back to years and years ago when when my father uh, was with the state police and then as he was elected sheriff and I remember him making the comment and this was right when meth really took a stronghold in in Crawford County in the, in the late 90s and and I remember he said you know everybody that is in that jail pretty well has one thing in common is substance abuse mm -hmm. um, whether they're abusing pills which was just beginning to be a thing uh, alcohol was always a thing um, so they either were in there because they it was a domestic because they were drunk mm -hmm. or it was because that they had lost their job and they didn't have any money and then their wife and he trying to make it and the, you know and it just all it all kind of cycled back to that substance mm -hmm. abuse uh, and when you get into a rule uh, community, I mean, you, you think of the Indian reservations, mm -hmm. where I mean that's just a, that's just a, a something that's there, and somehow you got to figure out how can we at least tread water in this faucet of ugliness that we can't get rid of. Mm -hmm. uh, like you said, you know, we're with our poverty level is because you know there's not a tax influx. Mm -hmm. uh, we have so much uh, land that's being you know used by the state that we're not getting anything from. And, and so we're, that we're working on that too, by the right. way. Right, and so I mean that really caps on income and abilities. And when you've got a sheriff's department um, that is only able to to hire eight people, mm -hmm. uh, and each one of the towns have a, a town marshal that, if, if they're lucky enough to have one, yeah, right? that's yeah. a that's a part time typically because it's, it's just really a struggle. And and the other side of the fence knows that. Mm -hmm. 
And so a lot of people come to the area. And, you know, it, it's kind of funny. I just was working with the Peru Police Department, LaSalle County, LaSalle County, Illinois. And, and I looked up onto this big screen and I seen this, uh, the, the monitor there, and it was a license plate reader. And I said, you have license plate readers? And they said, yeah, we're so close. They're about, a, they're about an hour outside of Chicago. Mm -hmm. He said, we're so close to Chicago, they dump all their ugliness over here. Mm -hmm. So we put license plate readers on all the major entrances into the town, mm -hmm. and now the bad guys don't come here anymore because as soon as they come into the town, that alert comes off. And sure. so I've already thought, I'm going to look into a grant to see if I can't get one at the four-way in Milltown. <laughs> There's got to be grant money there somewhere. Huh? <laughs> How many times have you heard that? You know, so, um, but yeah, that that is, and it, and it's, it is a... It is a struggle when you're always trying to hold your head above, but you have to be able to work with what you got. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think you do have a, a great uh, knowledge of, of the, the economic development and where the money comes from, how it can get here. And so I commend you for that. Thank you. So, um, so if, if November the 8th you were successful in your bid for the candidacy of the, the prosecutor's office, um, if you was to come to work on Tuesday, January the third, um, would you be painting the walls, or what would would there be any immediate changes that anybody would notice, or what do you have as, I guess you would say maybe a platform goal, or? So you know, my my term would actually begin you know, at the stroke of midnight on January first, right? Mm -hmm. So even though those are not working days, right, right. I. You would I, have to take a call for, if a search warrant came in. I, I already have this nightmare scenario where the call begins at 11.58 and then it ends at 12.01. And, and I, I, I know I've heard the story. But <laughs> I, I, it's my nightmare scenario that I, I'm sure is going to happen. And that, that's fine. That's part of the job, right? The 2 a.m. phone calls. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm supposed to be in my office at 8. I'm usually there by 20 after because the, the first time you take a call at 2 a.m. is the last day you care about being there at 8 a.m., right? <laughs> so... My day actually starts on the first and the second, right? And I, assuming, well, when, when the new judge, well, so the judge that started at the beginning of this year will not be the judge that's there at the start of next year, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. And it will be a conversation with the judge, the sheriff, and I about how we're going to function in the courtroom, right? And and what is the best way to make things more efficient? It's it's a lot of as. Um, as somebody in my office, my, my current office in Jefferson County, first do it as the monotonous stuff that I, I thrive on, right? The, the boring stuff, the, the minutia mm -hmm. is the stuff I really enjoy. So it's how do we structure the courtroom so it's more efficient? How do we, how do we set things up so that the, the backlog of cases we have can, can flow more smoothly? As for you know, the goals of my, my office, you know, there, are, there are certain enhancements we can use, mm -hmm. right? Now, of course, if there were deals that were made before January 1st, I, I'm, I think I'm, I'm not ethically obligated to, but I, I would be more or less obligated to follow that deal. Mm -hmm. But there are there are certain tools we can use, habitual substance offender, I'm sorry, habitual vehicle substance offender enhancements, habitual offender enhancements, priors. We can use those to, to build the, the amount of time that a strong judge can use in a sentence or that we can negotiate in a plea, whatever the case may be. And my, my goal, and to, to, be, to put it very bluntly, in my first year in office, there are going to be some people that are very unhappy because cases that have been lingering for a while and they thought, well, maybe they're not going to charge, they're probably going to get charged, mm -hmm. right? And I, my goal is it's, it's, it's not about filling the jail, right? That, that's not the goal. It's, it, it's not, that's not the goal. The goal is, is to get rid of the backlog of cases that exist, right? Treat, it's, it's about... The officers have a job to do, and so do I. And it's respecting the officers enough to follow through on if you give me if you give me a, if you were to give me a probable cause affidavit, you would expect me to do my job. And mm -hmm. it's to make sure it gets done. And it's to repair the relationship between all law enforcement and the prosecutor's office. That is part of the goal. It's also important that the judge and the prosecutor have a strong relationship. And I mean, it, it's common knowledge that the current judge and I have a very strong personal relationship. We're, we're friends. And the current sheriff and I have a very strong relationship. And it, it's about how do, those or, how do those people as individuals and as organizations work together in a way that best serves the public and best serves the interests of justice. Mm -hmm. That's good. You know, it, it, makes it, it makes it difficult when, um, you, you have a lot of ideas and, and, and you, 
you just can't. There's some things you just can't do. Um, what are, uh, and I just, I literally just had this phone call today. A uh, person asked me about how can I revoke someone's bond? Um, is that a thing anymore? And one of the things that, that I know typically happened in, maybe it was way in the past, and maybe that's the thing, it's been so far in the past, I, I can't even remember it, but, um, you know, a person puts a bond up, and that's a promise to behave. Mm -hmm. uh, and a couple of times I had to highlight that on the, I, I'd have to print out their document when they it's did something. It's also important what behave means. And, yeah. uh, and I would have to explain to them what a few of those things really meant. And, you know, I think sometimes financially when you get into somebody's pocket, you really get their attention. Um, what What's your feeling about, and if maybe maybe this happens in Jefferson County or it happened in Florida, what's your feeling about the courts actually removing the bond? And is that something that even can be done? Yes. So, I mean, okay, uh, and not that I'm actively taking a shot at a prosecutor in uh, Marion County, although I absolutely am. Yes, you can absolutely file to revoke somebody's bond, right? Mm -hmm. When you commit a new offense and you're out on bond or bail, depending, you know, the little different between the two, when, I mean, functionally they're the same, but terminology is different. When you are out on bond and you commit a new offense, yeah, I can file a motion to revoke your bond, and you can kind of expect me to do that. Mm -hmm. file, and I have done it. I do it. I did it today, actually, where you, you commit a new offense, you fail to show up for an appointment with your when you're on uh, supervision. The, the new offense is the bad one. And, yeah, I filed the motion to revoke your bond, and you can be held without bond kind of for a while. So where does, where does that money go? So it, if the money is forfeited, which, so it, it is, well, okay. If you are held without bond and we don't move to forfeit your bond and it's mm -hmm. just held, mm -hmm. then that bond is held until the end of your case. Fines, now, feed, court costs. Fine, and, fee, restitution, right? Mm -hmm. right? The other big one. Yeah. Um, and then the money goes back to the bond maker eventually. But so the bond, there's the bond that is the money and then there's the bond that is the document you sign, mm -hmm. right? And the money is only part of it. The other part of it is your promise to appear, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I know that Harrison County actually calls it that, your promise to appear, okay. whatever, which is which is terminology that, that is kind of interesting that they use. But the money itself is held until the case is over. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it goes back to your bond maker, you or the person who posted it for you. If we forfeit it, part of that goes to the county general fund, part of that goes to the state. It's It's... That statute keeps changing where it, it's because it has to do with 50% of 85% and then the remaining third of Correct. the 50. Yeah. And it, it turns into pennies that, you know, like fractions of a Kind of like traffic citations and where all that gets divided up into. Yeah, that's yeah. a good one too. Yeah. But yeah, it, it, it's it, part of the money goes to the county, part of the money goes to the state. But, but I mean, I guess the, the point to build to, though, is it's not – it is not my goal to make bond revocations a revenue generator for the county, right? right? I don't want to revoke your bond, right? But if you screw up, you know, at some point, you have to pay the piper when mm -hmm. you do wrong, right? And if you screw up, you, there are consequences from that. And yeah, so I actually had a guy who, the, the really common one, is if you have a domestic battery case, or any kind of domestic violence, strangulation, whatever it may be, and it is really raining. If you have a domestic violence case, inevitably there's a no, we, we request a no contact order, which is routinely granted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the wife beater will contact or have someone else contact, which is still a violation. And it is not only do you get the first bond revoked, but you will have an insanely high bond set on the new case, which I'm going to file, which, by the way, violating a no contact order is not only a criminal charge, it's a civil one you can be held in contempt, which is independent of the criminal charge. I have absolutely no problem doing that. Right. Because... The, the issue with a no contact order and an, int an invasion of privacy. One, it's you, you contacted a victim that we told you not to contact. But it's not just the crime, it's that the judge told you not to do it and right. you did it anyway. Right. Yeah. And at some point, you know, I, I, I'm not treating, I'm not saying that people are like children, but at some point, you've got to do something. Right. right. And if that's slapping them down, I mean, and it's holding them without a bond for a while, that's an option. That gets their attention. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever it takes. So, and while we're talking about bonds, and maybe you can kind of educate the, the public here, and, and uh, you know, Crawford County, in my experience, is probably one of the very few counties in Indiana that, 
that doesn't have bonds makers uh, doesn't offer that uh, that opportunity for for bail bonds in the county. Um, I know that's the judge's decision, um, but how do you feel about that? Is that something that you would be a proponent for, or there again, it kind of uh, it kind of makes it easier to make a bond? So. It's kind of the difference between a Floyd County and a, and, a, and a Jefferson County thing, and Crocker County in some way. So in Floyd and in Jefferson, yeah, bail bondsmen are not really a thing, right? Where it's it's court cash because you have if you're held on a ten thousand dollar court cash bond, if you put up ten percent of that one thousand dollars, that is considered your bond money. And the difference is is that you know a fifty thousand dollar or a twenty. Okay, I, I frequently worked in our high volume court in Floyd County and $20,000 court cash was not considered outrageous. It was actually my first experience doing a bond hearing in Jefferson County mm -hmm. when I had a moment where I didn't look at the bond schedule. And so when I requested $20,000 and I assumed it was court cash and the judge and the defense attorney look at me like I've grown a second head <laughs> because yeah, for right. a, a level six felony, I just asked that somebody be held on $20,000 cash only. Mm -hmm. That's a little excessive. Which would typically be a five thousand yeah, dollar. Yeah, five thousand. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's it was a little excessive. Right. But my issue is if if you have the court cash system set up, I I think that bail bondsmen have a place. You know, Dog the Bounty Hunter is is good TV, but that's that's not good law enforcement, mm -hmm. right? I think that can cause other problems later. It can cause other problems later, but when it comes to you know, it, it's not my goal to keep you it's not you know i can't set a bond just to keep you in jail because you're poor right that is wrong and i'm ethically prohibited from doing that and i wouldn't do that but you're it should be enough that it hurts if that bond is revoked and that bond is taken away from you it should be painful because i told you not to you know break the rules of your bond and you did right and that's that's just a reality and the bond schedule changed about four years ago mm -hmm. where it used to be you know there there an OR, you know, released on all recognizance, was maybe for a very minor infraction or something very simple. Um, maybe it was a medical condition, and they really, you know, the, the courts didn't feel like being in jail was the best place for you, and so maybe somebody would get an OR. But um, they've kind of changed that a lot, and that had nothing to do with the county. That was on the state level no. where they said basically unless you're a flight risk or a hazard to the community that try to make the bond as low as possible so you have to negotiate between what the state has said mm -hmm. what the defendant wants and what you feel is a good uh, uh, attention getter sure so yeah that's actually these that's a supreme court rule called criminal rule 26 and one of the pilot counties for criminal rule 26 was Jefferson County. Mm -hmm. So we, we're, we're well versed in, in the nuances. And yeah, the, the rule generally is um, you are released on your own recognizance unless there's a reason to keep you. Mm -hmm. And it has been referred to in the courtroom, it's not really a positive thing, the Chase Smith special, is where <laughs> I will go through your entire criminal record mm -hmm. and any time you've ever failed to appear, mm -hmm. including traffic court, any any failure to appear you've ever had now whether it changes the judge mi judge's mind or not that's up to the judge mm -hmm. but i i will routinely go through and if you have a lengthy record it can take a few minutes where sure. i will go through every failure to appear mm -hmm. or probation revocation or any time you've uh, a small claim that you defaulted on sure. or which is a court order which is a court order mm -hmm. court is court mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. i will go through your entire criminal record anything i possibly can to now whether the judge you know, OR somebody or gives them a low bond, that, that is the judge's decision and I respect that. But I will make a record of every everything I possibly can to hold you. Mm -hmm. Now, that isn't because I think you're a terrible person. It's because I'm giving myself the tools later that if you are OR'd and then you commit a new offense when you're out, I then say, judge, you know, when we were here three days ago, I had that one today, when you're here three days ago and you know, they were released on this, this is the offense they committed, and I would direct you to the record, you know, on this day at this time, and we read through it, and it just strengthens your argument to hold them on a sure. higher bond or without a bond. Sure. And it's, it's, it's all part of, you know, that's, that's, those are my Tuesday afternoons. That's just part of it. And I, and I think, too, that's something that a prosecutor um, has the ability to, there's always the may, 
and uh, Megan Shell, yeah, the two most hated her, words yeah, in, yeah, <laughs> right. Is that you know when you when you do have somebody come in on a on a Saturday night for an OW mm -hmm. or whatever it is, and and uh, and then Monday morning this guy's got a you know a, a, he's got a he's got a good job that he's been at for for 10, 15 years, and he's got two kids at home, and you know those kind of things happen. Um, I, the prosecutor has the ability then to suggest or mm -hmm. and, and yeah so I, I see that and I think that has made a difference in the community instead of just being a, a blanket policy that if you're arrested for a level six that it doesn't matter what it is it's you know, yeah X now dollar. it is worth saying that 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 applies to low-level felonies and misdemeanors right. when you right. get into you know the big five sure absolutely the, the truly yeah. serious crimes yeah, there, there really isn't. You generally don't let murderers out unless you're in Marion County. You generally don't let murderers out without a high bond, right? And it's, yeah, so that it is, of course, case-specific. And you, even a low-level felony, a relatively low-level felony, a, a level five, which is a relatively low-level felony, can have an incredibly high bond based mm -hmm. on the facts. Domestic batteries, we take very, very seriously. Because you know domestic violence, it's 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 a linear track, right? I mean, it's it's you may not start in the same place, but unfortunately, unless somebody intercedes, it all ends in exactly the same place. And so, part of the role of the prosecutor's office and the criminal justice is to kind of break somewhere in that cycle, because I mean, it's when 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 a when a victim comes in, this is not at all the question you were asking, but when a victim comes in, and they say, "Oh, I want to drop the no contact order. We just got into a fight." I'm like, okay, that may be true. It's not the first time you got into a fight. Right. It's the first time you reported it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not looking at Sean right now, but he's nodding his head like he can't <laughs> because all police officers experience this where, oh, no, I, I don't want to charge. I, I don't want charges filed. Well, and so part of the way that we're, to some people, we're, my office, the prosecutor's office is the bad guy, is that once the report gets filed, right. you no longer really have any discretion on whether I file the charges. And that's or where not. you always hear the people say, well, the state has taken over. There's nothing I can do about and, it. And mm -hmm. look, quite frankly, if, if I'm the bad guy because I'm keeping you know, a battered woman from dying, by all means, make me the sure. bad guy. I don't care. I, and I, I'm going to do the job I'm going to do, and upsetting people is not really something I care about. You know, it's funny you talk about Marion County and, and the severity of, you know, what we think is a crime. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I helped work a case in Crawford County where there was a, a very large utility truck stolen. And uh, it made its way to 465. Mm -hmm. uh, little to them did they know that it had low jack on it, mm -hmm. and that the company's tracking it the whole way. And Marion uh, IMPD, they end up recovering the the two suspects and and the truck. And uh, by the time we were kind of working our end of it, you know, uh, no big hurry because they're you know in jail for this auto theft mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff. Next thing I know, I actually think IMPD gave him a bus pass. And let him out the door, and uh, I, I I remember calling the officer, and I said, "Excuse me," and he's like, "Unless there's a body in the trunk, that's an everyday thing, you know, you know." So so again, having personalized, being able to personalize a county um, judicial system, it's not it's not rule book, and you flip to the next page and see where we're going. You're able to kind of customize that, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, you know, being that you've been around the county and the, and the system, I think that's probably a pretty positive aspect on your part. So, uh, Chase, I want to thank you today. Sure. Uh, and so if you could, uh, we have election, you know, what, is, what time is it here? It's uh, 650. So in two weeks from as we're talking mm -hmm. right now, the polls will have been closed for 50 minutes mm -hmm. and, and, and they're going to start coming mm -hmm. in. Um, so you've got a couple weeks still left of, of campaigning. If you could tell if anybody has any additional questions or has some more uh, that they'd like to discuss with you, what's what's a way to get a hold of you in your campaign? Sure. So if if you want to write me, right, my my, my if if that's something you want to do, snail mail is still a thing. I have a I bought a stamp. I, I you know I, I bought a stamp last week. So a couple of years ago, when there was when there was a fear of the postal service, you know, having their funding cut, mm -hmm. I bought you know um, it, what's bigger than the book, the roll. I yeah, bought two roll. rolls of yeah. stamps. Yeah. yeah, hey, forever stamps is the way to go, but because the you know they're still good. <laughs> so I I have a PO box in Milltown. You can contact me at um, my Facebook page, right, which is uh, Chase Smith for prosecuting attorney. You can contact me at uh, my website, um, friendsofchasesmith.com, where that, that'll get to me. 
Um, but yeah, Facebook is probably the most immediate way you can get a hold of me. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. If, if anybody you know what wants wants to have a one on one, if that's if that's something you want to do, I will do everything in my power to make that happen. I mean, it, it's it's important to me that voters know who I am, right? And and that sounds kind of you know small. But not necessarily, you know, my name on the ballot. I mean, my name sounds like an alias. I'm aware. <laughs> it's not. But it's important that I have the chance to, to meet voters. And, and it's important that I build a connection with you personally. Because I, I know, you know, I, I was raised in a family, as I said before, that, that appreciates public service. And I know that to a lot of people, you know, there's nothing more important to you than the faith they put into you when you cast your vote for somebody. Right. And if you're going to vote for me, which obviously I hope you do, I want you to vote for me because you believe I'm the best candidate for the office. That's great. Thank you again very much Happy to for do coming it. here today. Again, Chase Smith, uh, candidate on the Republican Party for the 77th Judicial Circuit uh, Prosecuting Office. And so again, thank you for civic duty of putting yourself out there as a choice. And uh, if you'd like to find out more, um, like I said, reach out to Chase. And if you enjoy this, uh, please contact us and let us know. We'd like to do more and we just want to educate the public on, on again, a choice. Yeah. Thank, Thank you for you inviting me. Yeah.